excuse me, I believe you're muted on Zoom. Sorry, can you hear me right now? Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted, Chris. Okay. I'm not sure if that. Uh, so do you record a sound here? Oh, no, on Zoom, right, okay. I think the beginning we skipped. Okay, great. So let's get um, this continue right here. Okay, so today we're going to talk about this upon driving, which has, um, which is more challenging in terms of decision making compared to the other applications we talked about before. And why it's, um, why it's challenging, here I'm going to show two videos, very short videos. So one is a lane merge negotiation at highway. And second one is a roundabout negotiation as well. So both of these are kind of challenging scenarios um, in terms of driving. But that's not the, um, that's not everything. We have many more challenges here. So first of all, we have this infinite state uh, space, right? Because you basically can drive anywhere. And also the state includes everything, not only the ego vehicle, but also the world, right? So you don't know where the other vehicles, where the other pedestrians are. I mean, they could be anywhere. So it's like very complicated or infinite state space and also continuous action space because you can do whatever action you want, uh, ideally. And also spark signal because you don't have a high reward at every single time step. Typically you only achieve something and get some reward. And reward non trivial to define and highly interactive inter environments, the capacity and uncertainty. This is because you don't know what others will do, right? Uh, other vehicles and pedestrian, they may have kind of weird behavior you, you don't expect in advance. And also uh, we have this safety issue, right? Because this unlike some toy game that you are playing, right? If we do something bad here in a driving, especially in the real world, it's going to be very costly, right? It's dangerous. So the, this is why it's kind of challenging um, to do safe decision making in autonomous driving. And I just want to make it a little more concrete here. So this is like the task setup we're going to talk about today. Um, so we're trying to eliminate the scope of this lecture, which is no commotion planning. Meaning that we are given a global planner uh, results. For example, if you are, let's say, driving on your own, you have this GPS and you have Google Map, for example, to know where uh, or which route you want to go and which at intersection, which direction you want to go, turn left or turn right, right? So you basically follow the route and respect the traffic rules. And also you don't want to collide with anything else. So try to be safe until you reach the destination. So that's basically the the task set up uh, of all algorithms we're going to talk about today. And then in terms of this task, uh, let's just give some very um, simple notation here and uh, we will use later. Probably you've seen all of them. Uh, so you know the ego space and then you have the observation which is coming from a sensor. You can have a camera on your car, right? Also you can have LiDAR and you can have GPS. Right. And then you know this command, this command coming from this uh, global plan, right? Like I said, to resolve some ambiguity at the intersection, you know where you want to go. You know you want to turn left or turn right to go to some destination. And sometimes this is like uh, something we also have, which is expert demonstration or trajectories. Uh, trajectories of data that you get from an expert, an external expert. For example, me driving, um, on the road, record some trajectories, and I just give that to you, right? And unknowns, uh, the first one is very challenging to know actually, uh, right? The world space, like uh, wherever other things are and uh, where they're going to go. The other two, transition function and reward function. Um, the second one is also very challenging to know because you don't know other uh, space, right? So that's, uh, that's why it makes the state transition of the entire world hard. The reward function, sometimes you can, you can define it yourself. For example, if you follow the name, maybe you can give yourself a reward. If you achieve some desire to be, you can reward yourself as well. Um, but there's no like, let's say vanilla or like Oracle reward function people use all the time. People typically define 
different kind of reward they, they like were specifically uh, for their algorithm. So this is like not trivial, uh, I would say, but something you can do. And then we want to get the policy, right? So we want, given the state, we want to optimize and find the best action. So this is like the, the setup. So we uh, we have these um, tasks here, and we have these um, inputs, the knowns and unknowns, and the outputs we want, right? So on the other hand, we also have something um, learned before, especially in your recent lectures, right? We have learn, imitation learning. Hopefully, I didn't forget uh, right now. We have kind of, kind of past, uh, past, passive and active imitation learning, and also, I guess, interactive imitation learning. We haven't covered so far. Um, Chris will talk about it on, on Wednesday. And then we have also covered reinforcement learning, right? Policy-based or benefit based So, uh, and actually many others, right? But actually, these two are the, the most recent one, I guess, in this course. So I guess right now, I want everyone to think about this question, right? So we have this task set up. We have the input, something we know, and we have the all the algorithm. So do you think any of the algorithm we learned so far can, can work in this task setup, this autonomous driving or restricted autonomous driving where we only focus on local motion planning? Anyone want to guess? This could be very simple. Think about what we have and what we don't. Immersed reinforcement learning. Good. How? Uh, could you briefly explain it or not? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's really great. I mean, you can learn a reward function. You don't need to define it yourself, right? So that's definitely one way to go. Anything else? I believe you learn more than one algorithm. <laughs> Something simple, even simpler than IRL. Think about what you have. So we have these um, uh, expert demonstration, right? Anything we can do with that? I'm not sure if Chris will be that, <laughs> if you don't know about that. <laughs> Behavior cloning, still remember? Okay, oh, I see some people still remember. <laughs> okay, so actually there are more, right? So those are two things we just uh, we just talked about. Uh, so actually, I would think most of them, uh, most of the things we've learned should, can work here uh, if we define them. For example, even for reinforcement learning, if we define a reward function and we are given the environment, it can also work. To some extent, right? Uh, we can just explore in the environment, for example, in a simulator, right? So a lot of them can work in theory, um, but the reality is that things are not that easy, right? So this person, uh, I think, is holding the steering wheel uh, at the beginning, but later changed to autonomous driving mode, and then uh, it just drives off road. So, so you have to take back the control to avoid colliding with. Uh... It's kind of still safe because it's off road, but no others here. <laughs> but uh, that is not so good, right? So, so meaning that autonomous driving, although a lot of algorithm we learn can get to work in theory, but in practice. There are a lot of things we need to get it done um, before making it actually work, right? So we need a lot of good practices and also design. So that's the thing we need to cover today, uh, which kind of comes to these learning objectives. So first, we will understand some state-of-the-art approaches, uh, especially in reinforced learning and implementation learning, autonomous driving, and then we will know we will get to know some of the good practice people are using right now in 2022 or 2021, maybe. Right, for autonomous driving, so that you may use it in the future. And then maybe you can connect some of the knowledge we, we learned today with uh, previous concept you learned, like in the foundation algorithm, and hopefully you can apply that later. Okay, great. So coming back, so this is a task setup we already talked about. Um, 
I guess everyone should know all the notations here, uh, right? And also there's no commotion planning. There should be no concluding, uh, com confusion here. No, because this is really important. If there are some questions, uh, we should address right now, I guess, especially in clarification questions. Oh, yeah, there's one. So, command is continuous? Oh, yeah, so command is typically discrete. So, for example, turning left, turning right, go straight. So, it's like um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, some venue, each venue indicating one specific command. Yeah, that's a good question because that's the only one you hear, I think, uh, because that's given by the global planner. Other things uh, probably you, you have seen before. And maybe to be complete, yeah. the output is the policy. Yeah, the output is the policy. Yeah. You want to output the action. Yeah. What um, influences the state and observation? What things go to the state and observation? Yeah, that's a good one as well. So observation typically coming from the sensor. For example, if you have the RGB camera, you get an image at every time step, right? And then if you have LiDAR, if you have GPS, you get something more, um, right? And then the state um, typically is like the equals location, actually, and that's um, coming from the GPS. And then you also get something more, for example, your speed, your current speed velocity, right? Um, probably you know acceleration as well. So basically everything about yourself, you can mirror it. But you don't know about others, right? You don't know how fast other vehicles are driving uh, and where they are. I mean, you can you can see them in images, but you have to marry them before you get to know them, right? For example, some distance estimation algorithm or something, 3D object detection algorithm, right? So that's something you need to estimate in order to know it. But for yourself, you know it. So that's the ego state. Uh, and also the orientation, right? So. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, observation is just the raw data. Uh, the ego space is uh, the measurement for the ego. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So then I think we already addressed this question. Uh, I guess uh, I saw someone knows it. So we talk about some of the algorithm that work, right? But what's the uh, most efficient one, or the, the simplest one. If you still remember, anyone can see the name? So we talked about three, right? Inverse reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning, and also imitation learning, or behavior cloning. Which one do you think is the, the simplest one, or the most efficient one? Behavior cloning, I see some voice there. Okay, why? Okay, supervised learning. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and also it's, uh, it's, it's fastest, I think, right? Because you don't need to interact with the environment. You get the data uh, in advance, you just train with it. Uh, well, reinforcement learning or inverse reinforcement learning, sometimes you need to interact with the environment. So then, I mean, you have to get the data during the interaction, interaction. So that's not um, something you have in advance, right? So. Okay, so that's uh, behavior cloning. And this is very um, simple. I guess you already learned in one of the previous lectures. This is passive imitation learning, uh, right? So you have the sensor input. This is observation, right, image. And then you have a neural network. This could be something simple. Um, and then you just need to predict the action or the control signal, right? How much you want to steer, throttle, uh, or do you want to brake or not? Right, so all of these data, uh, both including the observation and also the action, are recorded driving logs, right? So these are coming from expert demonstration. Um, so you just train your network with it. That's very simple. Uh, one of the simplest and the most efficient approaches, direct behavior only. But why is this uh, not good enough? So this might be, uh, I would say easy or hard. Anyone want to guess? Why is this uh, behavior only not so good? So that's uh, covariance shift. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's definitely correct. And I guess Chris already said that in previous lectures. Um, anything else? No. 
Not probably not easy. <laughs> because that's the obvious one. Yeah, so I guess um, there's another issue which is actually not um, a real issue. It's just like in terms of practice, something we can do better, which is um, task separation. Or So basically, if you look at this, uh, this whole thing, you have your input, which is the raw observation. You want all the way down to get the final action, right? So these are like you're solving the entire, a very complicated problem using a single network, which is typically not that large as well. Is that easy to, to do? <laughs> right, so basically we are trying to put too much um, pressure onto a single network, right? There's too much thing we need to learn here, uh, which comes to these, uh, the first practice we're going to learn, policy discrimination, right? So why not we separate the tasks, right? We are trying to learn a lot of things. We are trying to understand where the other vehicles are, where the pedestrians are, where they're going to move, uh, predicting their intention, and then do decision making for the eagle vehicle. A lot of things using a single network, that's too hard. Then we can just decouple the task, right? So that's come to this solution uh, of this paper. This is learning by screen actually. Uh, I think Chris mentioned um, one time in previous lecture, but today we're going to look into something more. So basically, one of the key points of this paper is trying to solve one task first, which is control, and then perception later. So using two set of networks, right, or two policy networks. So basically on the map, you try to learn one policy, and then on the right, you learn another policy, and then they are kind of uh, responsible for different tasks. Okay, great. So this is the first part. We're trying to learn, uh, learn these privileged agents, uh, which is expanding, uh, especially for control. So in this case, we are given the ground truth perception data. Because we are trying to learn, we're trying to focus on the control part, right? So we don't want to worry about the perception, right? So we're given like wherever other vehicles are, other pedestrians are, so we are, we know everything about the world. So that's coming from the ground truth, basically in the simulator. The simulator in the, during the simulator, if you run the simulation, you get all that information for free because it's simulation. Well, you don't have that in real world, but this is training, so it's fine, right? So during training, we try to leverage all of these ground truth perception data and also the traffic light, right? We want to know where they are, how far we're close to them, if they're red or green, right? Uh, so we only focus on the, uh, the control part. We're trying to learn how, how to do decision making given all the perception. So this is uh, the actual network they're using. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing as well. So basically you're given the, uh, this roadmap M. So this is not image. This is not your RGB camera image, uh, right? Because in RGB camera image, you don't have a lot of things. You only have the road sensor, road observation, but you don't know the distance, you don't know the location. In world coordinate, you don't know a lot of more uh, world states, but this roadmap includes everything like that. Right, so you can tell the vehicles, the blue thing, and also I think the red means the traffic light. Uh, the yellow means probably some pedestrians on the sidewalk. So basically you have those branches locations you just put there, build a map. That tells you everything about the world. And then you just pass through a skin, and the scene is conditioned on the eagle space as well. Uh, here we, we put a speed there. Right, and also the command. So those are the knowns we, we, we get uh, we get to know before. And we're going to predict a set of waypoints. Right, so you see all of these dots. The dots means that where the eagle vehicle should go in terms of the world coordinate, but on a bird eye view. So you are looking from the sky. Uh, so this is like, uh, this is moving straight, and this is turn right, turn left, and then go straight as well. Um, you're predicting multiple branches here because each of the branches is conditioned on different command. So like um, one of the questions um, we, uh, we talked about before, uh, the command, right? We typically, I think here they use four commands. Um, so just name, follow, and go straight, sometimes kind of the same thing, which is why you get the first and the last one, both um, straight line, but the other two is turn left and turn right. And then because at test time, uh, you know the real command you're going to execute. 
So you just connect one branch out of it to get your final output. Right, so that's very simple because once you have this waypoint, you just need to do L1 minimization, right? Because you have the ground truth or you have the expert demonstration, right? The trajectory. Right, anything confusing here? So F is just the function, the CN, right? M is the input map, V is the velocity, and your condition on a specific command that'll give you some trajectory. Do you use W here to represent the trajectory? So it's just like, um, L1 not between the expert trajectory and the predicted trajectory. Simple, right? What is uh, trajectory. So they use a uh, different notation here. In what sense? So what's the, uh, the dimensionality of W? Yeah, it's X, Y into multiple times step. I think they use eight. Uh, that's like two by eight, right? So it's like X, Y, T. Yeah, X, Y which is two dimension times t, how many t you want. So it's like a vector? Or yeah, uh, kind of the same thing. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter. Right, you just minimize uh, each pair of x, each pair of y, uh, and sum them. What is m? The rule map, uh, based on the input. That includes the other vehicle's location, traffic lights, pedestrian's location, et cetera. So a function f is just a the, road, the current roadmap. Yeah. The current time step or multiple time step? This one they use only the current time step. One frame. The map at the current time step and then the velocity at yeah. the current time step or yes. also the time step? Current time step. Basically, okay. the speed, um, they have a sensor to record the speed of the current Eagle vehicle. So we have the current map, yeah. current velocity, and then C is the, the, the context, which is the the future, I mean the past, or what is it? So it's like the command you want to execute right now. For example, if you are close to an intersection, and if you know you want to turn left to reach your destination on the left, so this command will be left, turn left. Okay. But if you are just on a street uh, road, and there are no intersection, problem just main for it. Okay, so you have the, the current map, the current velocity, and yeah. the current command. You put it into some neural network test, and then it's giving you I think uh, eight time steps into the future. Yeah. X, Y, Z position. Yeah, I think they only use bird eye view, so you only get X, Y. X, Y. Yeah, no, Z. X, Y, but over T, so X, Y, T, yes. right? You have multiple. And then when you have uh, S, A there, what is S, A? Yeah, that's a little bit more detail I, I, I wouldn't want to cover here. It's soft argmax. Um, but basically, you're trying to estimate the theme map of the waypoint. Um, so you so put the, the output. The output of F star is the uh, the blue map or the the like the, the actual X Y. Right so now. first you get some T map, which is from your C N, and you do some sort arc map to get the actual X Y out of it. So that's all part of F star data. Yes, and then sort arc map is differentiable, so you can back it. Okay, so W on in the figure. Yeah. Is uh, where the difference. W problem is uh, not, it's basically the output and the expert. W is the expert function, and then you, you have your predicted W, which is the function's output. So that's so the, the predicted, predicted output. The one would be coming out of the selection? Yes, yes. You only have to get one. Okay, so selection would choose one out of the four there. Yes, yes, exactly. Based on the command. And then that needs to match against the expert trajectory W. Yes. And because of the expert trajectory W is only happens with um, exact command, it's not for different possible commands, because you only drive for one possible situation in real life, right? So that's the expert, that's the nature of the expert demonstration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hope that everything is clear. Okay, great. So I have one question here. Can we use this privileged agent? This is something they call. Why is privilege? Because you have access to this roadmap, right? Because this roadmap encodes everything. So can we use this privilege, uh, privileged agent at inference time? I see a no there. Why? Can you explain? Yeah, 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 yeah. You are absolutely right. So we don't have the roadmap. So that's only something you can do during training. So you can train it, but you cannot use it during test time. So now we need to 
learn something that can that, that is usable during test time, right? So um, actually, I put the NS here. So there's a, another uh, situation where if you have something separate, let's say if you have an object detection algorithm, if you have a traffic light detector, you can actually build a roadmap at test time as well. But it's an estimated roadmap. It's not going to be um, the true roadmap that is used here. Okay, so typically we can't use this privileged agent, so we have to learn something else, which is this actual agent. And the task of this is to basically add the perception back, right? Because in a privileged agent, we only focus on the control part. Now we don't have the branches. We want to use the observation, for example, the image. And then we're gonna use the privileged agents we just learned to teach, teach the control part of this actual agent. Right? That's the purpose of we are going. We we learn this privileged agent. Uh, otherwise, we don't need it, right? So. And the network is very similar to what we just did, right? So we have a scene in there, but the scene is taking an image as the input not real map, but they are like quite similar in terms of both our uh, image representation because the roadmap is uh, it's also image. Uh, it's just not RGB image, right? So it's a, it's a bird eye view representation. But here is the front of you RGB image, but you can use a similar scene architecture and predict, uh, predicting some similar heat map and doing the arc max to get similar viewpoint representation as well, right? The only thing different here is that we're going to train this final viewpoint using trajectory from the privileged agent. This is not from expert data. The trajectory from your external expert that you collected before. And then we just use a similar L1 loss here because it's also between two different Ws. Um, and something more detailed here, there's a one T here uh, that we don't have in previous slides. T is, uh, is a transformation. Uh, why? Because we are learning from this image. So there is a front of view and a bird of view transformation. So you basically assume the waypoint you are predicting has a Z of zero. So you can do this uh, uh, transformation between this front of view to, to bird of view. If you have access to the camera's matrix, but then that's like a more of a computer vision perspective. The main point here is that where the most important question here to ask is, why are we using expert trajectory here? Anyone know the answer? So we're using the trajectory from the privileged agent to train this uh, actual agent, right? But we also have the expert trajectory. Why not using that? Any guess? Yeah, that's a good one. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more? So like where the actual trajectory is with the data we're using, where the actual representation is described earlier, but it is the cloning, and then we're kind of able to avoid that by having more sort of, uh, well, since we're using privileged agents, we're able to provide us with a more generalized and wider distribution of data. And then sort of yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think high level, that's very correct. Um, I guess that's very close to the next lecture Chris is going to talk about, uh, the final, Im final part of the imitation learning, interactive in imitation learning, right? So um, I'm going to cover that very soon, um, but I guess there's one other thing here, I think. There's one one other thing, one other advantage here, anyone know? So, so here, um, I'm seeing the word perception, but actually there's no explicit perception task happening here. So we're not detecting objects. We're not estimating, for example, depth or anything like that. We're just doing that implicitly, right? Because we only have access to this input image. So that's why it's called kind of implicit perception there. Um, it's not typical perception people are doing in the um, but you need to at least understand some kind of uh, concept or the network need to understand some kinds of perception in order to do this uh, driving, um, right, in a decent way. Otherwise, you're going to collide with uh, something else. Uh, the transformation is only happening because um, 
you are learning this uh, waypoint, but this waypoint is on the front of you, so you need to transfer transform it to the bird eye view so that you can match with the privileged agent, so you can minimize the noise, right? Because the privileged agent input is a bird eye view image, so it's directly in the bird eye view, but now you are in the front of you. That's the nature of the RGB camera. Yes. 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 But I guess uh, I guess that's kind of conflicting with the purpose of the privileged privileged agent, right? So we want to focus on the control part. So if we want to focus on control part, the bird eye view representation is actually the best. We're going to see that's more in the later algorithm. Why? Because the bird eye view, you have all these um, systems actually lay out in the representation. In front of you, because of this perspective projection, it's going to be harder to learn the concept of distance, which is why I guess people nowadays in the community, I guess it's different for doing planning, uh, more prefer bird eye view representation over this front of your representation. But I think technically you can do that. You can build a map on the front of you. Uh, you can label some kind of distance concept in, in that uh, front of you as well, I guess. It's just, to my knowledge, not really people are doing that. Yeah. yeah also, I think to supplement to that question, I think the reason why you don't want to admit directly is because the privileged agent is, is learning to like generalize to, to more scenarios. Mm -hmm. like yes. The F, the F star. If you were to learn from like a, from images directly, your model would only work on the images that it's seen before. So it wouldn't be very robust. It would like basically it would it would break anytime it sees images it's gonna see. Yeah, I guess basically if you have bird eye view, imagine you 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 have a camera. Uh, where you are in the intersection or any place, um, the same place, and everyone is at the same place, but if you move your camera around that place, you get a very different image, right? But it's the same place. Everything remains the same. So that's why kind of uh, there, the many to one correspondence, I guess. Um, basically, I guess that's, uh, that's the point of generalization. If you use it spread eye view, it's uh, kind of uh, easier to generalize to other things. Okay, so I guess uh, let's come back to this uh, orange question. Why not using expert trajectories? So this is something very important. Uh, it's one of the uh, very useful practice. Uh, a couple questions, sorry, go back. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. So first one is, uh, so for we're using input the perception and it's the actual agent. Um, yeah. What is, like, is there a big advantage over this compared to trying to learn from someone's coding of the bird's eye view and just having this literally make the central model um, in that respect? Um, that's, I guess, first Actually, that's very important. That's uh, that's the final approach I'm going to talk about. Okay. <laughs> that's a three-year chart turning into a paper. Uh, okay. So basically, they do something like that. Yeah. Another question is, um, I noticed that for the um, privileged agents, we there's relatively high privilege agents. Yes. Um, and it's like for the hard-coded um, elements that kind of take the. You mean the real map, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like all with the first time, you always take the hard-coded one. It's like important. Yeah. Is there any sort of yeah I th how do we know that that I guess the team later is kind of more cases with everything but yeah how do we know what's important what we use I guess that's a that's a hard question like using what representation to to encode everything the all the information about other vehicles uh, and also the road right you want to know the map of the road as well where's the name where's the intersection so I think right now in the community this per library representation is the one that's used the most uh, that's the first point and then for this kind of map uh, encoding, sorry. Oh, for this kind of map encoding, um, it's actually not in, um, most efficient and it's redundant, um, as you see. Probably another thing you can do is vector representation, right? So you're not doing this kind of rasterized map or rasterized image to encode, for example, for the name, you give a value of one. For traffic light, you give a value of uh, something else. 
you maybe want to encode the actual x, y, z and their connections uh, using a graph. So that's like they call it, uh, vector -right representation of the map. But it's kind of hard to use it, um, like how to use that as input. And also, that's only for the rows. How do you encode also the, uh, the objects into it? So I would say that's a still active research area. Um, and the most of the approach right now are still using this rasterized image. So you just put every single channel for different things. For this channel, you put, for example, you can, um, there's the simplest thing you can do is uh, like the, the one thing that I just mentioned. For everything, you give a different menu uh, in the image pixel, right? Or the other thing, you do the multi channel images. For each channel, you uh, represent them for one thing, for example, vehicles. And they just uh, zero one binary channel, right? So for the part that's with vehicle, you give one. For part without vehicle, you give zero. That's one channel for vehicles. The other channel, you represent them for, for pedestrians. The other channel, you'll reference them for something else. You just can't collect all these channels. So there are multiple ways of building this roadmap, but I think right now that kind of image representation is still the, the simplest one to use, I think. Uh, but it's definitely redundant one. Uh, but you can use the end, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so coming back to this question. I guess this one is hard. But it's very important, so let me tell you what. So one thing that's different here, if you use privileged agent to train versus using expert trajectory, definitely the one that you just mentioned. We are not limited by the expert demonstration. Probably we can do more. But there's one other thing we can do is we can have sensor supervision or stronger supervision signal on um, multiple actions. Here, the actions actually mean um, it's not the actual action we're going to output. Um, maybe I should change the word. It's an imagined command. So basically, if you, if you still remember the previous, previous agent figure, you're also predicting this multi-branch three points, one for each command, right? And then although in the real world, you only execute for one command, that's your expert demonstration, right? Because you have to choose only to do one thing at real time, uh, in real time. Our, sorry, in real life, and then you're gonna pass by, right? So you only get the actual action state sequences for one command at every same time, uh, every time step. But here, since we already learned this privileged agent, that can predict weak points for different commands. And that is the same for this uh, actual agent winner. We also predict multiple weak points. Can be on different commands. So actually we can put supervision not only on the final one we choose, we actually can put the supervision on all of these reports. Condition on a different command, so that's what I mean. Here, basically, you get four times more supervision. Chris, do you have a question? I thought you you had one. No, I, I, I guess I just wanted to repeat like the, the big picture of this paper. Yeah. Which is, well, their claim is that it's more efficient to learn planning and perception separately. Yes. That's the first one, the policy discrimination. And the second one is the, basically this one. You get a denser supervision, and actually these are practice used by almost all of the approaches right now, uh, as we will see in the algorithm. So basically you have these imagined actions or imagined commits that didn't happen in expert demonstration, but you can get supervision now from the privileged agent. So that's something uh, unique here. Yeah, this is just a very simple question. Is it instructive or evaluated in terms of this um, supervision on multiple commits or imagined commits that didn't happen? Anyone else? So this feedback, is a instructive type of feedback or evaluated type of feedback? Not sure if you still remember. This is, I guess, like the high level typing presentation a long time ago in previous lecture. No one will guess? Yeah? Instructive, what? Instructive, what? 
once you know um, what was uh, uh, once you know what trajectory was should have been what what is the right trajectory, then we know all the other trajectories are wrong. So you are talking about uh, all the other trajectory means the trajectory of comment uh, condition are other comments, right? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I don't know the answer for this. I think it's close to instructive, but it's not pure instructive because here you get four comments in total. But actually, that's all. That's not all the actions you can you can do for a eagle vehicle. It's just an expanded set of uh, actions that you get different kind of outputs, the waypoints, working control signal afterwards, steering or throttling. But it's definitely more than evaluative, which is only the one actual command that you execute in the real world, right? So it's a little bit better than that, or it's a little bit more than that, but not the full space of the action you can do. So I would think it's something in between. Yeah, it's probably more instructive than you guys because uh, it, it's saying, okay, if you have four, com four possible commands, yeah. then here are the four possible waypoints yes. that you need to, to, to hit, and everything else is wrong. Yes, yes. Right. But even for a single lane funnel or a single turn app, you probably have different kind of uh, turning app options. So like uh, there are some more differences you can do there, right, in yeah, terms of that's action. It, that's not in the, it's not in the lock function. The last one, yes. you, you have to hit these blue, yes. Yes. blue circles. Yes. So in that sense, I think it's, it's instructive. Like there yeah. could be an argument for saying that's evaluative, depending on how you set up the last one. I see. I think the way they do the here, it's, it's, um, it's some regression, it's like map regression. Like yes, yes, they say map regression. Yeah, but, but the target, I think, is binary. Like it has to hit. A certain yeah. I think it's yeah, I agree. I don't. I don't believe you will be evaluative. I was just saying it will be more close to instructive. That's yeah. yeah. You could make it evaluative if um, maybe you had a distribution over future waypoints, uh -huh. and uh, then it would become more like evaluative. You get a score for every trajectory that uh -huh. you generate. But you still evaluate on more imagined actions or imagined comments that you didn't have, right, in Act part. The imagined actions part doesn't, doesn't really matter so much as the instructive and evaluative. Uh-huh. Yeah. I see. Yeah, because you, everything is just treated as data that you're trying to fit. Like, the, I see, I see, I see what you mean, yeah. The, the privilege, the privilege. Yes, yes, that's coming from the privilege agent. Uh, it's just like which one you want to see if if it's with re with, with respect to the privilege agent. Um, probably we can see that as true, I guess. But if we are talking about or with respect to the the external expert, which only have one set of uh, uh, state action sequences, you don't have all the other comments. You don't know what will happen there. So that's like you only have evaluated. Right, feedback for from the expert demonstration, the the expert, not a privilege figure. So just to avoid um, confusion, so here we have kind of two experts in the sense. One is the privilege agent. It's different from the actual expert we are talking about before, right? The actual expert is the one that we use to train the privilege agent. But there's one other question there. Yeah, I just want to make sure you're like, a summary of understanding. So the reason this is uh, working better is because the privilege is also more generalized, more robust. And yeah. The reason more generalized, more robust is basically the state representation is a lower dimensionality, namely that it's a wider distribution, mm -hmm. more robust, compared to just more generalized with a high frequency image detail. That's yeah. kind of generally helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely one important point. Uh, I guess you also mentioned the other one, right, uh, earlier, the interactive uh, later, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have this privilege agent, so actually let's come to the next slide. So. We can actually interact with the environment using these uh, privileged agents, right? So we can run a simulation for this actual agent, and that will encounter some new image, some new state, right? some new data that you don't have in the expert, in the outside, the external expert, right? And then how do you supervise on that data? You use the privileged agent, right? So the privileged agent, you can run on it. 
because in a similar, you still have the ground truth, the input to the privileged agent. So you just get some supervision. This is unpolished supervision for the actual agent. Right, so you can further fine tune. So actually in their orange law paper, actually they train in three stages, right? So you first train the privileged agent offline, and then you train this actual agent offline, and finally you train it online, right? Interact with the environment using the privileged agent. So the third part is trying to resolve this uh, covariance shift because you encounter more, more new data that you don't have in expert uh, demonstration. Uh, I see. Oh, okay. That's your question, Chris. Uh, okay, no problem. So, yeah, I think we already talked about that. How we just use the privileged agent to do this uh, on policy supervision in the environment, right? That's something you can't do with the experts. So actually, I feel like this is a type or similar to something uh, that we learned before. So these uh, privileged agents, which give you some supervision or give you some results or outcome if this decision you make is good or bad for the new state when you interact with the environment. This is very similar to inverse reinforcement learning, right? Because you try to learn some reward function that tells your agent if it is good or bad, and the reward function is learning from the expert demonstration. So this first part, I felt like this privileged agent, right? You're learning from the expert demonstration as well, and then this privileged agent can be used in the interaction with the environment to tell you how good or bad your action is when you encounter this new data, right? So this is very similar in the concept. And also in other things, very similar to this, the interaction, interactive imitation learning, right? So, but that's something I guess Chris will cover later. Basically, you can use this privileged agent to do this interaction. You can query it in a simulation. Okay, so this is like a, a quick summary. So direct behavior cloning, we saw with a single policy, and now we are solving using policy distinction, two policy networks, right? Um, this is direct supervision by expert data. Now we're using privileged agents to supervise, right? And then supervision only on the state and action, expert visited. Now we interact with the environment. We can do that technically if you want. It's just a little bit more expensive. Um, yeah, and then, they actually have a lot of demo. This is the one that I find. So I think generally it works okay, but sometimes it's a little bit dangerous if you see at the beginning. Oh, so let me. This is the actual agents. The actual agents, yes. It does stop uh, when the pedestrian comes and the other vehicles there. But sometimes I, I just feel it's a little bit weird uh, where something that a human driver will not do similarly. And this is only like some of the videos uh, we picked up uh, that is good. But actually, if you, if you see their performance on the leaderboard, you only achieve less than 10 in terms of score, meaning that it doesn't work for, for many cases. The full score is 100, the driving score, the first column, right? So uh, it's very bad, actually, yeah. What is the driving score, how is that measured? So that's actually a little bit complicated. Uh, for, I would prefer not to talk about here. We can talk about uh, uh, after class, but basically it's a metric that summarizes everything here. Right, so you summarize, okay, how much route you complete and uh, how much infraction you encounter and how many traffic lights you, you, you run over and how many vehicles and pedestrians you hit. So that's like over, over a score, higher is better. You want to reach 100, but it's only 8.94. Yeah. Meaning that there's still a large covariance shift because on the training I didn't show here, they actually do much better in terms of this score. This is on the uh, testing. So can we do better? Um, I guess in terms of time, probably I should cut some of the material, but this one um, is actually a very straightforward one, right? So we are talking about imitation learning so far, right? Um, this is like using privilege agent, we can do active uh, imitation learning, or we can also do direct behavior cloning, right? 
But there's another set of algorithm you learned before, right? Reinforcement learning. Can we do RL to solve this local motion planning? It should look very similar, right, to what we just uh, talked about, the direct behavior cooling. It's definitely possible because you just feed the same thing to the network. You get the same output. This is the policy you're trying to learn. But now you just interact with the environment. You do exploration, and you just train it, right, using a standard RL setup. It's not offline anymore, right, you, because you don't have the expert. You don't use the expert demonstration right now. I mean, you, you probably have, but you didn't use it. Uh, but actually solving this task, it sounds easy. It's not that easy. If you look at the benchmark or the leaderboard, actually most of the methods are imitation-based methods. Reinforcement learning-based methods are kind of, I don't think it's under explored. People are doing it a lot. It's just like getting to work and on the top of the leaderboard, it's not that easy. And then there are multiple reasons. So typically RL requires a lot of more data, right? Because you need to do this exploration, try on error, and you need to make the training iteration very fast or very short for every iteration. Because the simulation and interaction takes too much time if every single iteration is slow, right? That means you need to do a lot of sacrifice or compensation. For example, a smaller network, right? Restricted input size, use a smaller image, and also you have a large memory consumption. I'm not sure if this is covered, but basically for reinforcement learning, you have this replay buffer uh, as one of the typical tricks. If the images are large, you want it large, right? Because the traffic light is very small. So you won't get more pixels. Uh, but if you have a large image, which is like a few hundred times a few hundred, you're gonna have a very large storage of replay buffer because you also have a very large set of data you want to store, right? Because training RL requires a lot more data. And the simulation takes time. So basically all of these are coming from the efficiency issue. Slow, large, right? So that's why it's hard. I mean, it's possible, but it's just getting it to work. You need probably a lot of GPU, and then you need to train for a long time. And that's uh, something not easy. So can we improve some of this? Uh, there's one question? Yeah, no, I mean, could we potentially just cover it? I mean, kind of did this a little bit before we started the trip. Um, and then, and then, excuse me, and then to apply our own complex requirements. Exactly, exactly. So that's definitely one thing to do. Um, but there's other direction, which is, uh, I guess, this paper I'm going to talk about. Uh, it's very similar. So you do this pre training, right? So basically, the idea is pre training. But you also want to handle something more in the pre training which is the perception thing. So that's what they call this pre-training with semantics or affordance. So there are approach called implicit affordance. The idea is very similar, right? So we want to reduce the memory and we want to speed up the network and we want to use a larger input. So why not we just do pre-training and compress the image, the raw observation to something smaller, right? That's very straightforward. So we only use the low dimensional features for RL. That's coming from a CN, for example. But actually designing that CN um, actually takes some practice, right? You can do, for example, just auto encoding. Use the image, compress feature, reconstruct the image, the orange image, you can do that. But actually they found that uh, there are a couple of tasks, if they do, they get much better performance. So this is the set of tasks they, they choose as in. So you have this semantic segmentation hat, and you have this uh, traffic light state and distance estimation. These are just like um, some regressor and classifier combination of them. And then also if the vehicle is at the intersection or not, that's also a classifier. And also the lane center, if it's close, or deviation. So all of these are just some simple regression and classification. You can use L1 loss. <clears throat> and cross entropy not, those kind of things to learn all of this. And you have the label for this because this is again training in simulation, right? But basically what you want at end is this one, this hidden feature. That's something you use in RL. And you don't need all of these decoders 
when you're training an RL setting. Very simple approach, but basically an idea, in addition uh, to this reducing um, the feature dimension from the raw center observation to no dimensional feature, and also you want to partially solve this perception task. This is a very similar idea to learning by cheating, right? Um, you kind of decouple the task, but here um, it's a similar thing. You have, you basically train it in two stages, right? This is the first stage. But the first stage is trying to do partially some kind of perception because you encode that some kind of information in the hidden representation. And here is one analysis. So basically, the main point is trying to show they are going to be better in standard RL, right? So what they compare is, okay, let's just do standard RL, right? First and see if it works. Actually, it's kind of working, right? Because you see um, the y-axis is the percentage of the intersection cross. Like how many intersections the Eagle vehicle has successfully passed. You can see it's like kind of a return uh, or reward to get, right? How much success you get. So that's something they use as a proxy. And the reinforcement learning agent, the direct reinforcement learning agent, starting to get better. You know, cross some intersection, but it's really slow, right? You can see the convergence speed. It's much, it's much smaller, uh, slower than some of the other approaches. The ones that's above, the red, blue, and the green, those are basically their model. Uh, that use more, uh, that's used pre-training. But combination of different kind of tasks they pre-train on. Right? So some like use pre-train on all tasks, some like only part of the task. So that's basically a simple idea. Pre-training uh, basically needs to faster convergence and higher accuracy. Actually, the second one, I'm not 100% sure because I don't think there's one uh, group right now has just finished the whole training of the direct IO, right? So if you do that, maybe you can reach something similar. Uh, so that claim probably from the paper is not 100% um, correct because they stop, they do early stopping. Um, but certainly you get faster convergence uh, for sure. Yeah, so this is a very uh, simple one, I think. It's just one technique that I think almost all of the pros are using, which is pre-training with schematic or off Um They either do it just as a side task, just pre-training, or just reuse whatever people pre-trained before. Um, and for other part, it's pretty much similar. Here we do online IR training as well, but we just add additional staff. And we partially solve the perception. This is again the same technique we meet in LBC. More memory efficient and faster training so that you can enlarge your network size, enlarge your input size a little bit. That's typically what some revision people do, right? If you get your network larger, you typically get better performance. Yeah. So I think here, just summarize all the things we just covered, imitation learning and reinforcement learning. Yeah. Just a good question. Um, what is affording to be here? So that's a really good question. I think it's kind of um, coming from another earlier paper, kind of similar to the concept of distance. Um, but actually used in many other conversion um, tasks as well, not just for uh, autonomous driving. But for autonomous driving, there's one earlier paper that is doing some kind of Distance estimation. For example, when you drive on a road, you're probably on one lane, but you estimate your distance to the vehicle, to other vehicles in your left lane, in your lane, and your, your right lane. You just estimate three numbers, right? For example, 10 meters, there's one uh, vehicle on your left lane, which is 10 meters away. There's one vehicle on your lane, 20 meters away. There's probably no vehicle on the other, on your right lane. Probably just estimate some lacking number or something. And then those numbers are something they call affordance. They're trying to predict. But I guess um, that's probably some concept inherited from other conversion tasks as well. Uh, but basically, that's something usually related to distance, I think. Yeah. Or how much space you can use while being safe, right? Yeah. Okay, so I think this kind of summarized. Uh, so passive imitation learning is very efficient. I suffer from covariance shift. This is a well-known well issue. Policy destination, a very important technique we just talked about. This provides denser supervision. 
and also simplify tasks because you decouple two things. Um, and syntax revision is also very important. And also it gives the chance of doing active IL, right? Because you can interact with the environment. You are not limited by the expert as demonstration offline. Reinforcement learning uh, is better exploration, less covariant shape. But it kind of requires a lot of more computer um, computational resources and data training, memory, a lot of things. But this pre-training can help you with that. Yeah, so I think we have 15 minutes left. So I think we just probably will cover one last thing here. So we have talked about this imitation learning, right? And uh, passive, active, interactive. We can do all of this with all time striving, and we can do RL as well, right? But can we combine the best of two worlds? Right, so we want these two good properties the efficiency for maintenance learning, and also this uh, exploration. So we can more, we can be more robust to covariant shift, right? So basically there are a class of hybrid approaches that are using both things. And the one typical thing um, you just mentioned, right? So you can do pertaining with imitation learning, like behavior cloning, and later you just fine tune with reinforcement learning. That is, Definitely something you can do, right? That belongs to this hybrid approaches, I think. But there are a lot of more things people are doing nowadays here. It's kind of, I feel like this line of two approaches is not that clear. Uh, people are kind of using techniques from both sides uh, in the most recent approaches, yeah. So one thing, uh, I would say this is kind of very straightforward thing people can do is um, this paper, uh, they're trying to unify the supervision. So if you want to combine these two things, imitation learning, reinforcement learning, right? you can do pre-training, but pre-training basically you're training things in two separate, uh, two separate stages. Uh, you, can't, you, you didn't really train it in one shot, right? But can we train it in one shot, right? The real thing or one of the questions to ask here is, uh, is uh, how to unify the supervision because they are different. Imitation learning, this is something you typically use, right? It's expert demonstration, and there's typically no reward defined here. I mean, you can define something, but in behavior cloning, we typically just do this supervision on expert data directly. And reinforcement learning, we're just doing some exploration in the environment. We get some reward, and then we update, for example, the Q value. Right, so there are kind of different supervision signal here. So if you can unify them, probably you can just train your agents in one shot or in one state, right? So this is a very simple assumption. This uh, one of the paper of uh, hybrid approach is doing is that because we call it expert demonstration, would be needed from an expert. That's why we're doing this whole imitation learning. Right? We're trying to learn from the expert. So maybe we can assume these experts are very good, they are near perfect. Meaning that if this underlying policy, if we run it in the simulator, it probably gives us a very high reward. So that's the assumption they make. It's kind of reasonable, right? So because it's expert, if you believe it's expert, it should perform well, not on a offline, um, collected, pre-collected uh, pre expert demonstration, but from also on the uh, environment. So we basically just assume these extra funds always get a high reward. So that's a very simple assumption you can use. So this approach called general reinforced imitation, GRI. Like I said, it's very simple. Um, it's just a reinforced learning combined using the expert demonstration. First of all, you, you do some initialization. Right, this is a very standard. You initialize um, your replay buffer, which is empty. But in the meantime, you define something new here. The first one is this demonstration reward value. Basically means these, uh, the constant high reward you want to assign to this demonstration agent, the extra demonstration or the extra policy. For example, just 100. 
at every single time step, you still assume the expert policy always get a very high reward. And also the probability of using this expert, they call it demonstration agent. I mean, uh, it's the same thing. You can call it expert agent. So how did they get the uh, no reward value? That seems like non-trivial to get. Yeah, they don't get it. They define it. So basically they assume these experts always receive a high reward in the environment. But do they like write out the reward function or do they, they just say, okay, 100? Reward yeah. 100. Yeah, exactly like that. Score of 100 on yeah, they give a very high score. I think it depends on the task. Just to choose. Randomly? Not randomly, definitely. So you have to probably find a good one, good number for it for different tasks. Because for different environments, different tasks, you get different kind of reward, right? For the reward yeah, function. I think on their paper, they just say they get the maximal, the maximized uh, uh, reward they can get using other policy. So it's just like upper bound number. So for example, if you run some other policy, like the policy in there, you get some of the rewards based on how you define reward function. Because the de definition of the reward function is actually that very flexible. You can define it any way you want. Here, there's no predefined reward function. Right, I think what they use is something like um, if you follow a link, you, re you receive a reward one. Okay, so they have some definition of the reward. Function, yeah. They, they came up with it. Yeah, otherwise they can't see the RL agent, right? Oh, okay, so they have yeah. some reward that they define. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Such that the uh, expert demonstrations get high reward. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically, yeah, that's the first one we are talking about, right? The extra reward or demonstration the reward. Key demo. The, the P is the probability, how much you want to use. So that's a hyperparameter. That's also a hyperparameter you want to use in addition to the reward. That's a hyperparameter. Okay. Yeah. Those, those are like hand defined. Yeah, both are hand defined. Uh, okay. Yeah, R defined, P defined. And then for this one, it's the standard RL update, right? So if you have enough data in your replay buffer, you just do one step of RL updates. For example, if you use D2N, you just update your one step TD error on your Q function, for example. I mean, if you are using extra credit, you just need to have more, um, more gradient to compute your Q of Bay and your policy. But basically, whatever you are using, whatever RL algorithm you are using here, you just update this gradient based on the data in the replay buffer. In do these RL network updates? Yeah, I, I can see how our demo is used. The demo is yeah, it's not used it's right not now. Used. It's used uh, here. It's used later. Okay. P demo is the uh, is the menu you want to use to collect the data from the expert demonstration. So this first one is the standard RL data collection in the environment. The second one, basically, when the random dot random. Uh, it's smaller than P demo, meaning that you are choosing your demonstration agent to collect the data. You just get data from this offline um, data you already had before. This is your expert demonstration. And the R demo is the parameter we talked about before. Okay, so I think something that's missing from the input set is uh, there should be some set D that contains all of the expert demonstration. Yes, yes, yes. That's yeah. basically the sample from this D. The D is the whole set of the expert demonstration. Or do they have access? Or do they actually have access to the expert no. policy? They don't have expert policy, so they only have the expert demonstration, and then they sample from it. Okay, um, so some with so with some probability. Yes. Yes. They sample the like read in from expert demonstration, yes. and then with some other probability, they're gonna like interact with it. Like this. Yes, yes, yes. Regular yes, yes, yes. And then for the expert data you get, you also assign an R demo to reward for it. Also. So basically that's all the differences here. Very straightforward, right? So you just get more data, you never get more data from the expert demonstration. Yeah, one question. So instead of basically just doing the application uh, learning and reinforcement learning, you just kind of use the start next to match based on the probability. I will not say back and forth, it's just like, uh, with the probability, yeah, it's like within your batch of data, it, it has some 
RL data or the data reflected using your RL engine in the environment and some of the data reflected from your expert. Right. Is that like pretty much about our demonstration? Like how expert study is doing in expert demonstrations or like what's the advantage for those? So I think it's kind of based uh, correlate to what we talked about before. You want to leverage the imitation learning or the expert demonstration to speed up the convergence to get some efficiency, right? Because that's already some data with some signal, supervision signal there. And then also you want to gain the exploration capability using RL, right? Because if you only do behavior cloning, you, you can't do that. You can't encounter uh, some new data. Right, yeah. so this is better than doing the sequential data replication there. That's actually a good question. Yeah. It's hard to say because they didn't really compare that. Oh, okay. So basically, we are, um, so basically we can imagine this as a parallel. Right, and then there's also cascading. Uh, I don't think, th like the one that you just mentioned, right, you can first do IL and then RL, right? Or you can do back and forth. IL, RL, and then IL. Actually, there are pros to doing that. Uh, so basically, you, you kind of have a multiple iteration. Um, but this paper, they only compare with these uh, direct RL, so which is SAC. I think it's soft extra credit. Uh, just an extension of extra critical method. Um, and then this, which is this uh, purple one. Yeah. yeah. So basically, if you add, so this 10%, 20%, 30%, uh, 30% is, is the P demo, the hyperparameter, right? The probability you're using from this uh, expert data, right? So basically, if you use 10%, that's the maximum performance you get for this particular task. 10% uh, of the expert. Or is that 10%? Expert, 10% of the expert. It's P demo. They don't show like 100% expert. Yeah, they didn't show 100%. They don't show 40% expert. Yeah. And it looks like it. It's already lower than that. It's actually. saturated. Yeah. Actually, this is the one that's. What is the The SAC, the purple one. No, expert. Oh, the expert, right? So the brown one at the very top. So that's one. Is that one hundred percent expert? Then? Reaches, yes. Yes. It yes. Reaches that at, but that's not. There's no training there. It's just the. Um, it would have been nice if they would have shown the training tip with one hundred percent expert. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> see how long it takes to do it. Yeah. So then I'm, I'm guessing that having the RL helps you to cover it faster, but maybe not. Yeah. Also, probably it's also good to show using one hundred percent, right? Or more percent. One hundred percent. Like 50, yeah, 60. Yeah, one hundred percent of the expert data, and then how long it it takes them to hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, this is not a good result. Right? This actually is uh, it's an okay result because you do get faster convergence, right? The curves are higher, and also at the end you get slightly higher performance. Yeah, it, so it's, it's faster than reinforcement learning, right? right? Yes, That's yes. Not factor predict. Yeah, that's a soft actor well, practice. What they, what they don't show is 100% uh, expert, which might converge like to the best performance right away. 100% expert. Yeah. Actually, no, right? Because you already see the trend; it gets much worse, right? So the the red one is 10%, green one 20, orange one 30, blue one 40. You already see like worse and worse. It's hard to tell because the color is so hard to. Yeah, I agree. The blue one, the purple one, kind of very similar. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see from zero to ten percent if you let go of that jump that entire gap. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree. But basically, I think there's one other point uh, I was planning to point out here is that this expert, the brown one, is actually better than the file performance it gets from the SAC, the RL. Yeah, I mean you would. Have you would hope that when you have RL, you, you get to surpass the expert. So it looks like none of these, at least on. In this, in this table, the RL didn't surpass yeah. at the end of the chain. They already train at like and millions of samples. Walker TV, so this is not Carla, right? Not Carla, not this Carla. Mojoko, yes. Mojoko, yes, yes, yes. Exactly. This is also on another non Carla data set, but this one actually is a, is a different one to this. So if you see this one, the SAC, the purple one, which is a very good one, actually reaches very 
close to the expert, the brown. The, 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 the purple one. The converge, the one that's converging very fast, similar to the red one, slightly lower. But basically, what's the one on the very bottom? That's the one using 40%. 40%, using right. 40 of the expert data? Yeah. It's very counterintuitive, right? So basically, the point here is that they actually, they actually provide some analysis later, is that actually there are also other papers. Uh, I don't think time, I don't have time to cover is that the expert data is not really good. That's the, that's the why it's kind of only slightly better in that case and actually not doing better or doesn't help in this case. The expert, I mean, if you don't use the expert, you just train our agent, you can get a similar performance to the expert. I mean, the expert is actually not that expert. They actually analyze the data, the expert data. Where is this group? This is a VELO, so they are VELO, V-A-L-U, the one that's in Europe doing a time study. VELO? Yeah. Yeah. It's probably the most popular one uh, versus WAVE, yeah. WAVE, W-A-V-Y-E, yeah. Yeah, UK WAVE, yeah. Yeah, this is like so... Basically, I think the point of this is that the expert, the quality of the expert policy is very important. This is something they developed in another CVPR paper after this, which I don't have time to cover. Is that this expert quality is very low here, and uh, they have some techniques to really improve that. That gets further boost. So we have like a one minute or yeah. two minutes from the Google Center wrap up. Yeah, 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 I agree. So, so basically, yeah, I think I'm going to jump to. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah, I think this will be summary. Oh, sorry. So basically we have these um, direct behavior cloning at the beginning. That is like mostly imitation learning, no interaction. And then we have this learning by cheating, right? So you can do some interaction with the environment and there are some more techniques which is policy discrimination, task separation, sensor supervision, and et cetera. And then we cover this, I think, direct IL and implicit affordance and GRI is the one that we just covered. The general reinforced imitation. We actually almost finished. There's one other, but we don't have time. That's the one, the Roche, is the one that's improve your expert data by combining imitation learning and reinforcement learning, because we've seen the quality of the expert data is actually very important if we want to use it to improve the RL approach. If it's not that good, you can't really do better than the, uh, pure RL if you combine. The, the, the dimension that's missing here is the performance, right? It's yes. Really, really efficient, really do a lot of interaction, but it's horrible. Yeah, actually it's, it's similar to this trend, the one that I'm presenting. Uh, the later one actually gets better performance. But the performance is, is actually very correlated with this, uh, the practice I talked at the very beginning, right? So I think that's basically the file of size here. Oh. So I think we cover the first one, task separation. Second one, policy discrimination, right? So you have this um, privileged agent that give you sensor supervision. And also, Privileged agent allows you to do interactive imitation learning or any active imitation learning. And pre-training of the RL, alleviate the efficiency issue of reinforcement learning. That's something we cover as well. The last three, uh, we cover only the middle one, the quality of the expert data. That's actually very important if you want to do hybrid approaches. Because if the expert data is not better than RL, you probably doesn't get a lot of gains out of it. The other two is the silo two approaches we didn't cover, but uh, it's very important to actually use this good practice in order to get this pure RL or imitation learning based approaches work. So that's it. I think um, um, that's everything for this application of time saving. If there are any other questions, we can we can chat offline. Yeah, Chris, do you want to cover anything else? Well, we're a bit over time. So. Yeah. But uh, I hope this gave the class some uh, access to like state of the art methods and how this RL and imitation learning is being used for autonomous driving and other 
like we simulated that. And I think Shinjo touched on a lot of like practical issues about like inefficiencies and, and data and feature representation, all these like little tricks that are needed to get things to work, which like we didn't touch on at all in the class. We just focused on algorithm. 